Either the cross of Christ, the crucifixion event, was a mere fluke of history demonstrating that even the holiest of lives is quite useless and quite meaningless in this chaotic world, or it was a demonstration that God is so wonderful in love and mercy and compassion that he could permit himself to be nailed down and still win. And that's the question and the issue that we must contemplate as we consider the last hours of our Lord's life. Was it a fluke? Or was a demonstration that God is so strong that he could allow himself to be crucified and still win? So good. Today we're going to look at the trials of Christ, but I want you to notice what happened on the eve of the trials as he was led from Gethsemane. So we're going to look at John chapter 18. It tells us in verse 3 that Judas, procuring a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there, Gethsemane, with lanterns and torches and weapons. So here is a crowd, over 500 in number, coming with torches to find the light of the world. And they're led by a disciple. There are none nearer to hell than those at the footsteps of the altar. The reason why a great number of very good people will have nothing to do with Christianity is because there are so many bad Christians. And Mahatma Gandhi was asked, why are you not a Christian? He said, because of Christians. Most religion is bad religion. But remember, you never find a counterfeit $13 note. Counterfeits only exist where there is a genuine Lilies fester worse than weeds. It is the very best things that become the very worst. A stench on the road doesn't come from a rock, but it comes from something living that has died. And in the reference to the betrayal by Judas, as he kisses Christ in Gethsemane, we see the warning that to be religious is either to become much better or much worse. The religion of the cross will lead us to become much better, to reflect our God. But if we just take it as an outward profession, it will make us much worse than if we hadn't touched it at all. And we will note that as we come shortly to the story of the most religious men that ever lived, Caiaphas and his crew. But first observe here in verse 4 that Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you I am he. If you seek me, let these men go. Please observe two things. This story is here to remind us that Christ could have avoided the cross. The New Testament wants to underline the fact that he willingly takes the cross. He willingly goes to Gethsemane knowing that Judas is coming. He's foretold that Judas will betray him. He knows all about it. He could escape it. The fact that when he stands up and his divinity flashes forth for a moment and hundreds of soldiers collapse the ground is proof positive that he could have dodged Calvary's cross. In a moment, he could have overcome the soldiers at Calvary. That's the first thing to notice. The second thing is these words, if you seek me, let these men go. These men were the representatives of the ancient law. They came from the Jewish watch and the Roman soldiers who supported the law of the country. And when Christ said, if you seek me, let these men go, he was telling us the gospel in a nutshell. Christ permitted the law to take him and to work on him its penalty so that you and me could be let go. If you seek me, let these go their way. He's acting out the whole meaning of the cross. 
he will let the Lord take him and crucify him and bury him in order that we might be let go. That's the important thing. Let us now notice the matter of the trials themselves. Come back to Matthew, if you would, and please observe in chapter 26, in verse 57, Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. Then in verse 59 it says, Now the chief priests and the whole council sought false witness against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus was silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you're the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You've said so, it is so. But I tell you, hereafter you'll see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his robes and said, He's uttered blasphemy. Why do we need witnesses? You've now heard his blasphemy. What's your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. And they spat in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? Here's the most important interview of all time. The most gifted, the most enriched, the most privileged people of religion that have ever existed until that time are trying the Son of God. The issue becomes one of tradition versus truth. Caiaphas and his glorious regalia is at the head of 20,000 priests. He's in control of what happens at the temple. He runs Judaism. He claims he's there to save the people. But now there comes another saviour. And the hierarchy is going to have to choose between one saviour and the other between Caiaphas and Christ. The problem is, and there's no way out of this catch-22 except the gospel way, the trouble is this. Religious proclamation does call for order. God's a God of order. There needs to be organisation. And there needs to be leadership. But on the other hand, all order tends to decay, to ossify. Institutions become idolatrous. They become self-worshipping. They turn means into ends. And the essence and the spirit dies out of the institution and then the institution is dead. So wherever you have order but no spirit, it's dead. But if you have spirit and no order, it will die. So here is the problem with a fallen humanity. We need organisation. We need leadership. But unless the gospel is central, unless Christ is always at the heart of things, the institution decays. And soon it's the institution against Christ. Soon it's tradition against the truth. Soon institutions crucify people. And the truth is buried that the institution might live. This has happened in all the ages. When William Carey wanted to go to India, he formed the first great Baptist missionary society. But after he'd been ministering in India for nearly 50 years, men changed back home and people took over that society who were interested in statistics and traditions. And soon William Carey in the heat and the trials and the troubles of Indian missionary endeavour finds there's no sympathy at home. He has to separate himself from that group, the group he'd founded. John Wesley was told he was too enthusiastic and the Anglican Church lost him and Charles, Charles who wrote thousands, literally thousands of beautiful hymns. 
They were considered too enthusiastic and so that's how the Methodist Church was born. Wesley had no wish to leave the Anglican Communion. But the Anglican Communion had ossified. It had become a self-worshipping, self-perpetuating institution that turned means into ends. And so the truth was crucified and we got Methodism. The years went by in Methodism and there was a talented young couple called Catherine and Bill. Their last name was Booth. And when the organisation of Methodism began to determine and decree that William Booth could only preach within a certain circuit and not go outside of it, when they did that the Salvation Army was born. So this is a tremendously piercing and vital theme that the Bible draws to our attention that religious institutions unless they are constantly reforming through the gospel will ultimately crucify the Lord that established them. How sad and tragic it is. In this story he who is the truth is confronted with false witnesses. Everything about the trial is illegal. It was illegal to hold trials at night but he's first tried at night. It's illegal not to have counter witnesses, but all the witnesses are on one side. Everything here is illegal. Notice that Jesus responds to the admonition to say whether you're the son of God. When he says you've said so, that was an idiom for that's true. And he quotes Daniel 7 about the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Please notice this text. It's a key text, verse 64. I tell you hereafter you'll see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. At that point he's standing. He says soon you'll see me coming enthroned. At that point he's a prisoner about to die. He says when you see me in the future I'll be coming as God. At that point he's being judged, but he says the time is coming when I will be the judge. One of the Gospels puts it this way, Nevertheless, from now on you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven on the right hand of power. He came at the resurrection when the earth shook. He came in a sense at the destruction of the city of Jerusalem where once there'd only been three crosses outside the city, now there were thousands. The Jews who'd rebelled against Christ and said his blood be on us and our children, they swallowed their jewels. The Romans were besieging them. At night they crawled up over the walls where the Romans were waiting and they caught them, they cut them open, they took out the jewels and then they strung them up on crosses. Jesus came in 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem. He came at the fall of the Roman Empire. He came at the time of the French Revolution when the church owned a third of the land and most of the wealth and were neglecting the common people. He came again in the Russian Revolution though it became a scene of terror. But Christ forever comes to shake up the world so that people are forced to make decisions and to turn to the true privilege of service the reason for our existence. Hereafter you'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tears his robes and thus he symbolised the tearing up of Judaism to take place in his day. He was forbidden to do that but he did it. Then it says they spat in his face and struck him and some slapped him. And another of the gospel says they blindfolded him. Please observe that everything that happened to Christ is what we deserve. Christ is a sign to all of us. Because we're proud of our appearance, he spat on. Because our ears itch for flattery, he hears curses. Because we've abused our liberty, he's tied to a pillar. And his hands are bound. Because we've loved the wrong things, his side is slit open just under the heart. Because we've used our minds to think bad thoughts, his brow is pierced with thorns. Because we've carried idols, so to speak, his back is whipped. 
nothing happened to Christ but what deserves to happen to me and to you. So we see him here as our substitute and as our representative. Remember the key meaning of the cross is if one died for all, then all died. 2 Corinthians 5.14 God has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. As it puts it in Romans chapter 5, it says, while we were yet sinners, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. That's Romans 5.10. While we were yet sinners, we were reconciled. Before we were born, we were reconciled. Long before we were converted, we were reconciled. It's a matter of whether we'll accept it. While we were sinners, we were reconciled. Yes, when did the lamb die in Egypt? before the exodus. It didn't wait till they were in Canaan. The lamb died while they were still in captivity. The first Passover. And as the first Passover lamb died while the Jews were still in bondage, so Jesus died for us while we were still in the bondage of sin. And the meaning of the cross is that he took my place. He was my representative, which means it's counted that I did what he did. That's why Martin Luther said, Mine are Christ living and dying, as though I'd lived his life and died his death. So the New Testament says in Galatians 2.20, We were crucified with him. We were crucified with him. When he died as our representative, heaven looked down and saw the whole human race crucified legally. We were in him. You see, we were ruined without asking for it in the first Adam. We were in him, seminally as every tree comes from an original acorn. We, trees of humanity, come from the original acorn of Adam. So we were ruined without asking for it in our first representative, but we've been redeemed without asking for it in our second representative. And the meaning of the cross is he's my representative and he's my substitute. There's a difference between these two. They're complementary truths. It doesn't say in 2 Corinthians 5.14, if one died for all, all need not die. The meaning of him as a representative is that God counts it that what he did, I did. So the New Testament would say we were buried with him, Romans 6. Colossians 3, 1 says, if you be risen with Christ. Ephesians 2, 6 says we're seated with him in heavenly places. So everything he did is put to our account. None of us kept the Ten Commandments perfectly, but he did. It's put to our account. There's never been a Sabbath keeper since the fall, but he did it properly, and it's put to our account. There's never been one that loved God and loved his fellow man as much as they ought, except Jesus. It's put to our account. And then he's my substitute. He does it instead of me. This is the meaning of the cross. This is the meaning of Gethsemane. And when we read this 67th verse, but they spat in his face and they struck him, some slapped him, saying, prophesy to us, this is telling what I deserve. He endured what I should endure. Come now to the story of the interview with Pilate. Come please to John's Gospel in chapter 18 and verse 28. Chapter 18 and verse 28. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was early. They themselves didn't enter the praetorium so they might not be defiled but might eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them. Please note, they take Christ to where Pilate is staying, where the Praetorian guard is. But these hypocritical Jews who are about to murder a righteous man, who don't try him fairly, who bring in false witnesses and bribe them, these hypocritical Jews won't step over the threshold with Christ. They shove him through the door into Pilate's house. That's what it means when it says in verse 28, they themselves didn't enter. And notice that they might eat the Passover. These Jews were the most zealous religionists of all history and the most rabid and murderous bigots of all history. Again, I say that if our religion doesn't make us better, it makes us bitter and it makes us worse. And the Jews are so religious that they will not cross over the Gentile territory lest they be defiled, and yet they crucify an innocent man. They crucify him and then they go home to keep the Sabbath. That's a typical example of poor religion. 
when people become secondary and the church has hirelings rather than shepherds, then you know the religion has gone into deterioration. Because true religion has shepherds, not hirelings. Shepherds care for the flock. These shepherds only cared for the fold, the material fold, the institution. Religious, but hell-bound. Verse 29, Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If he wasn't an evildoer, we wouldn't have handed him over. Pilate says, Take him yourselves, judge him by your law. The Jews say to him, It's not lawful for us to put any man to death. Verse 33, Pilate entered the praetorium and called Jesus, said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom's not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, that I might not be handed over to the Jews. But my kingship is not from the world. Pilate said to him, Are you a king? Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born. For this I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who's of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What's truth? Pilate is a typical worldly administrator. He only cares for survival. That's the mark of a worldly administrator. They say, after me the deluge, like the ancient French king. They only care for bread and butter and the incoming wage. That's all he cares for. We remember Pilate for two things. You know, it's interesting that people call their dogs now Pilate or Herod. They never call their dogs Jesus. Pilate and Herod treated Jesus as though he was a dog. But human beings now view Pilate and Herod as dogs. The things we remember Pilate for are his statement, what is truth? And behold the man. And there he answers his own question. What is truth? Behold the man. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So this worldly, sceptical, compromising administrator did ask a question and make a statement that's of supreme value to us. What is truth? Everyone should ask it. You know, all the philosophers of the world have never been able to agree on any single thing. I have studied and taught philosophy, and the wonderful thing about it is, when you look at it all, there's no agreement after millenniums of philosophy on one single topic. Philosophers are like blind men on a dark night looking for a black cat in a room with no windows and the cat isn't there. <laughs> That's human philosophy. What is truth? My friends, a bird can't fly out of the atmosphere and a philosopher trying to find the truth about heaven is like a bird trying to get out of the atmosphere. But God can put his hand into the atmosphere and touch the bird. That's what he's done in scripture. He's put his hand into the atmosphere. Jesus says, for this cause I was born. I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. Notice it doesn't say the truth began with him. People today say, we don't want anything to do with the Bible, it's a Jewish book. The sun rises in the east and settles in the west. No one in the west says, we don't want anything to do with the sun, it began in the east. No one would dare say that. Truth did begin in the east. You know, God either had the option of coming down every night over the big cities and saying, I'm God, you better do what you're told or else. Or he could select the people, give them a revelation of truth, and perpetuate it through that people. He chose the second, otherwise we wouldn't be free. If you came down every night over Melbourne, we'd be so scared to death we'd obey. But we'd be hypocrites, we wouldn't want to obey. So God chose a nation, and when people reject it because it's Jewish, it's like rejecting the sun because it rises in the east. So the truth already existed. Christ didn't institute marriage, it already existed. Christ didn't bring a new law, thou shalt not kill. It already existed. It's important to understand that. The New Testament can't be understood without the old, but the New Testament always has the casting boat because much in the old runs out as it hits the new. Shadows stop when they reach the tree of which they're a shadow. Many things in the Old Testament are only shadows and they have gone. So the expression, what is truth, is important to us. It says then, after he'd said this, he went out to the Jews and said, I find no crime in him. It's interesting, the New Testament refers seven times to Pilate saying, he's innocent. Seven times. 
And there are seven people in the gospel record that testified to his innocence. Chased them through sometime. Pilate's wife, had nothing to do with that just man. Judas, I betrayed innocent blood. The centurion, this man did nothing amiss. And those that were with him, Pilate, I find no fault in him. Nor Herod. If you count up the number of people that said he was innocent, there are seven of them. Seven groups testified to his innocence. I find no crime in him. But you have a custom I should release one man for you at the Passover. Will you have me release for you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. And another gospel tells us he was a murderer and a seditionist. Barabbas is a figure of Satan and of all sinners. Satan is a murderer from the beginning and began sedition in heaven. And now the world, the religious world, chooses someone like the devil rather than someone like God. But they're always doing that. Dear friends, never expect to be with the greater group if you're a Christian. The greater group always choose wrongly in spiritual things. They always choose the devil rather than God. Not this man, but Barabbas. But Barabbas was a murderer. Barabbas was a thief. Barabbas was a seditionist. The world always chooses the devil rather than Christ. True religion is always a minor thing. Sadly, the church often does the same. If it is forgotten, the motto of the reformers, the motto of always reforming, the church will go the way of the world. It's the religious leaders who prompt the mob to cry out, not this man, but Barabbas. Barabbas. Barabbas represents all of us. He could have said when he got the news, I don't believe it. It's too good to be true. I'm staying in prison. A lot of people do that when they hear about Christ dying for them. Or he could have said, when I'm a better man, then I'll leave prison. A lot of people say, when I'm good enough, I'll become a Christian. No, friends. Go out immediately. You've got to come to Christ to become better. Barabbas has a lesson for us. Believe the good news. Don't stay in the bondage of sin. Barabbas has a lesson for us. Don't try and make yourself better. You and I are in ourselves sinners. We cannot make ourselves better. We come to God that he might make us better. You know, in some manuscripts it calls him Jesus Barabbas. Barabbas means son of the father. He was a Jesus son of the father who's a murderer. And then there was Jesus son of the father who was the real. The counterfeit and the real faces us all our days in all our ways. In all our choices, we have to choose between this man and Barabbas. We choose between Jesus and the devil. In what we think, in what we say, in what we do, in how we spend money, in how we spend time, in how we use our faculties, our talents, our gifts, it'll be this man or Barabbas. Pilate washed his hands when he should have used them. He should have used his hands to free Christ. People find it convenient to wash their hands of heavy moral issues. They're quite content to do nothing. But to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Here we see the danger of indifference, the danger of compromise, the danger of politics in religion, the danger of choosing the devil in choosing the, instead of choosing the Son of God. Barabbas that day probably watched that central cross. I wonder what his feelings were. No doubt it constantly came to him, this man died for me. And as I read the scriptures, I have to confess that I am a Barabbas. I had a part in murdering the Son of God. I've been a seditionist against the government of God until my conversion. I deserve the cross, but he died for me. That is the good news of the gospel. And let us receive it, let us believe it, and let us live by it. God bless you.